We now have a brief presentation by Mr. Tom Darden of the Investment Fund Cherokee. So, Some cities. 
This was America when I was beginning to think about my place in the world. I was worried when I saw that, that photo, the first photo of our living planet from space. Any of you remember that? We had never seen the Earth, which is ironic because we live on it. We could see that it was a living planet. I felt compelled to do something about this. Later at university, I wrote my master's thesis on acid rain and air pollution from coal plants. My first job was at the Korea Institute of Science and Technology in Seoul, where I worked on pollution from burning coal, which was used for home heating and for cooking. I saw pollution throughout East Asia. I returned and went to Yale to become an environmental lawyer. But uh, in the U.S., practicing law, as, uh, as, as some people think it's somewhat boring, and I fell in that category. Thankfully, I got a job working at a banning company in steel plants on energy efficiency. In 1984, I converted brick plants from burning fossil fuels to burning biomass, which was being dumped into landfills where it turned into methane gas. We became mostly carbon neutral, except for our electricity use, and I obsessed on finding ways that we could make carbon-free electricity. I was never successful. In 1985, I discovered soil pollution at one of our brick plant sites from decades of petroleum use. I found some professors at Virginia Tech University, Virginia Polytechnic University, which is not far away, professors who dealt with soil bacteria, so we began to grow bacteria which would consume pollution in the ground. I funded their business by assistance technology, and we created Cherokee Environmental to clean up contaminated soil all over the East Coast. And over the years, we cleaned up 15 million tons of dirt. That would be enough that if you stacked it all up on a golf course, it would raise the level of that golf course by about 400 feet or 130 meters. We began to buy contaminated property to clean up. We raised over $2 billion for this for buying and remediating pollution on land. We've owned 550 properties in the U.S., Canada, and in Europe, including a refinery site not too far from here in Trieste. Trieste. Some people think Cherokee is a real estate company because it owned a lot of property, has owned a lot of property, but our property work is driven by our pollution focus. I saw that we could affect pollution by working with smart scientists at Virginia Tech. We don't have, we don't internally have the capacity for scientific innovation. We're business people, we're not scientists, but we realized that we could find scientists who had ideas. And so we branched out, we kept doing this with other professors at other universities. Between 1985 and the present, we've started our investment in over 100 venture, technology, or startup companies. Many of these address water or air pollution or energy grid management. Almost none of these were our own ideas. These were others' ideas. My primary goal is to reduce pollution. So for years, we've been going abroad to transfer technology because that's where most of the pollution is. I go to China regularly to advise officials and business leaders on methods and processes for addressing pollution. They've declared 19% of their land to contaminate for agricultural use. And this is mostly due to air pollution. Air pollution dropping contaminants on the land. Obviously, this is a huge social issue. I began to do this in the former Soviet Union in the 1990s. And we have also explored similar paths in the Middle East, in India, and in Indonesia, focusing on areas with most population. In order to address the world's environmental problems, solutions must be ubiquitous. They cannot exist only in Europe and the United States. In the early part of this decade, Cherokee had entered a relatively stable part of its history. The next generation of leaders was being prepared to carry our values and processes forward, and our existing projects were operating smoothly. My children were in their 20s and 30s, and I was spending time with them and with my wife for the first time really in 35 years. I had rebuilt my experimental airplane, and I was installing a parachute in it, looking forward to using it more. The airplane. 
But one day, I received a random call about, uh, about cold fusion. I didn't give it much credence because I remembered in detail the disclosure of Fleischmann and Hans from years before. And I believe the subject was hit. Then 30 days later, I received another unrelated inquiry from a different group. So we began to do some research. And then 30 days later, I received a call from another group. I had never invested in 100 startup or technology companies. I had never gotten an inquiry about fusion about LNR. Three in within uh, 30 day intervals. We funded two of these groups, and then later, as many of you know, we licensed Andre and Rossi's technology. Since then, we've made grants to university groups exploring technologies in this space, and we continue to fund additional teams. We envision an ecosystem of collaboration where great scientists can work together to develop the many systems and technologies society will need to shift away from polluting fossil fuels. Our goal is to bring non-polluting energy to those who need it most, especially in the developing world. We also don't believe that there's one solution. We believe that there are many solutions to these problems. To implement this vision, we determined that a business-based approach would be the most effective strategy. We looked at many others. I know that some of you have felt that businesses are or have been adversarial to your work. I understand that. Honestly, 
driven by the better angels of our nature, not impaired or constrained by the behavior of others. We also need not be constrained by our own minds. Ironically, the expert who claimed that flight had achieved its limits in 1921 was Norval Wright, the inventor of the airplane. And the expert who declared that fission was not likely, that of course was Einstein. We must be ever vigilant to keep our own minds open always. Your time has come. The frenzy of fear gripping China and India regarding air pollution and also water and land pollution have created enormous demand for new ideas, less constrained by the past. Second, the increasing reports of success by many of you continue to offset the presumptions of skeptics. But it does not benefit any of us, nor does it benefit society. If we achieve success, we lose our values. Let's encourage one another to put the needs of society and the needs of others first, as we contemplate how to achieve the victory. We have the ability, you have the ability, you have the ability to give the world a healing gift. Many also will have the opportunity to benefit I'm a businessman and I believe business is usually the most effective means for achieving social or environmental reform, as well as for implementing technologies. Business is usually the most effective means for achieving social or environmental reform. I believe that. But we must always think first about the needs of others, about the needs of society, and the needs of our planet. I do not want success if it comes at someone else's detriment. My goal is to give your science a way to get out broadly and equitably to the world and to see you receive the honor and rewards from your efforts. Indeed, provocative as it may sound, we've reached a tipping point. The potential of your work is so great, and the signs of promise are now so significant. This is our simple manifesto. To pass on the world that is better than the one we received. Abundant, non-polluting energy widely available, would make the greatest contribution to this goal. That's a manifesto pledge for us to keep. It's a promise to you, to those who went before you, and to our children, and to their children's children. Thank you. We have one question for Mr. Carter. Uh, given the subject, what is your time frame or timeline? What is our timeline? Uh, I have found throughout our work that patience is is a virtue. Patience is important. And Many people in business, and especially in the venture capital world, I hate to think that we might be in the venture capital world, but I guess that's sort of what we do. Uh, many people in the venture capital world want to move very quickly. Of course, we would like to move very quickly as well. But they tend to stop. They tend to stop before success is achieved. And I think they tend to stop too quickly. In many instances, we've stayed, we've stayed with technologies for 15 or 20 years uh, and continued when we were seeing promising results. So I hate to say this as a business person, um, although for the most part we use our own money and so we're not worried about investor returns as would be some of the venture funds, but we don't really have distinct time frame. Um, sooner is better than later, but, um, but we are willing to stay for a long time, and I don't want to move so quickly that we miss something. Um, so I guess I would have to say we don't really have a time frame, and, uh, and uh, we don't intend to give up.